we pick back up on this episode of Awful Stupid with Atlas, now Bellamere, the god of love and war, standing along this bridge behind him, the very ruins of the door that served as a launching point for fiends all across Goron. And across from him stands Kristoff and Ezreal. In between them, the ash and bones of a corrupted frost. And they're met with nothing but silence and echoes in this drafty underground chamber. What do you guys do next? Um, Time to leave them, huh? Agreed. Time to leave. Can can we leave? Are we stuck here? Um. I, I, it's, I'm, we gotta start walking. I guess we'll head back the way we came and we'll, be, we'll find an exit. We can't stay here. We could, but I don't think it's a good idea. What say you, Bellamere? It's time for me to go. Christoph, you are a very special person. And your, your fate is not over yet. I, I sense the sadness uh, that you have in your heart. All is not lost. This is only the beginning for you. Uh, with all due respect, uh, you murdered my friend. So I'm not really talking to you, right? Well, I. I guess I did just ask you a direct question. Um, is there? Can you get us out of here? Is that a thing that you? Can I did do? not murder your friend. Um, in a way, he's he's always been the the chosen one to help restore the gods to their to their full count. He, and you knew him well, and I, I have vague memories of of his time with you, of of how good a person he was and how much love he had, not only for you but. It seems to be for for all of mankind. Yeah. Um, I just... You can see where it's not exactly the same for me. You can see how I'm never going to sit in a red roof inn and eat hard biscuits with my friend again. And that's great that you're back. It really is. I'm sure that meets the cosmic tapestry of the universe and I'm sure world peace and love will come to this world and that's great but I'm going to miss my friend and I'll miss you too Christoph but yes I can uh, I can get you out of here uh, I don't know where you'd like to go and your, your friend can, can go somewhere else if she'd like I have nowhere else to be no other plans we did it i'm back <laughs> and and we i did. thank you for your help for for the sacrifices you've made and and i know that you have a lot to clean up now but i know that the world is in good hands we've we've ensured that the people that were created that they would always be cared for by those who who cared enough for humanity itself to carry on and you've done that where would you like to go good for you uh silence please and you I'll go with him and so at almost mechanically as if operating from memory from this innate just will to do things um you you summon back Willow, the right arm of Bellamere, and you raise your axe up, and ever so gently, almost with precision, you cut a line in the air, and you form a tear, and at first it sparks with these red bolts between the two lines in the very tapestry of reality, and then you see a portal, a small portal form, and 
in it, you can see the throne room of Prima Tassel. Um, and I imagine if, if they're going to walk through before they do that, um, Belmare, I reach behind me and I pull out this tin, this box, and I hand it over to uh, Christoph. And I say, uh, these hot biscuits always were the best. And I'll uh, nod, kind of bow my head. Thank you. I step through. I, I extend my arm to Ezreal. I wait for a second. Um, Bellamy, if you could, uh, if you are our god, could you pass on a message for me? I don't see why not. Would you be so kind as to ask Alistair if he's satisfied? I can. Thank you. It was a pleasure. For some. <laughs> uh, so she takes uh, takes Kristoff's arm. And we walk through the schism. And you walk through this portal, and you feel your your stomach twist and turn. And you almost feel like you've been like spun from top to bottom as you land on your feet in the portal, just a little disoriented, traversing through time and space. Um, and you're in the middle of this throne room of Prima Tassa, and we will get to that in a moment. Bellamere. Atlas, as it were. You stand in the middle of this damp room with these ruined doors and the world feels suddenly very small. A world full of adventure and excitement and danger and fear. All of those things seem to just kind of fade into the distance. And as your memories meld and they start to return and you remember the war that happened between you and your brothers and sisters and you remember the creation of Goron and all of the squabbling from start to finish but you can't seem to remember what happened between now and then you almost have this gap. And so you have this longing, this innate need to go home. But before you do, I think, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, despite the fact that Atlas was your vessel. You almost filled this need to go see Henry. And you raise up this blade, you raise Willow up, and you cut into reality again. And this time stepping forward, you land. Feet first, as if gracefully stepping from one room to another next to Henry. As he's working hard in the forge building weapons and you notice it's cold and you can tell that you're on the front lines of silence just outside of the dome when I appear am I as Atlas or am I as like the, the full power visions of you are Bellamare Henry Farrier. And he turns around. What the? And he grabs a blade and like raises it to you. How did you get in here? And I want to, if, if I have the ability, just like a hand just comes down to kind of calm him. Uh, in what just way? Be like, just like his emotions. Like... Just kind of, it kind of affects his emotions. Calms his emotions a little bit. Yeah, so you, you raise a palm and kind of lower it and with your divinity you kind of like force his emotions to be suppressed 
Uh, who are you? Who I am is not so important as who I was. Who I was was a son to a father who loved him very much and took care of him in a time of need. I was Atlas for a time, and Atlas showed himself to be the vessel, the creation that I hoped that all orcs and, and, and minotaurs would be, a, a true creature of love and power and strength. Um, and in him, he awoke with me. I was reborn. And I'm thankful for that. But there's a part of me who still has uh, Atlas and, and has a, a, a strong connection of this love that I know it's all too well for you, Henry Farrier, and for Teresa. And so I want to give you a gift. I don't understand. Whoa. Where is my boy? Atlas is no more. But he's not hurt. He's not... He didn't suffer any pain. He's he's not in any way in, in a place where someone should be afraid to go. In a way, we are the same beings, except I am me. I am Bellamere. Uh, I don't have the words. I... This must be a dream. Am I the 12 foot version of myself currently? Yes. Can I shrink to the six foot version you, of me? You are a divinity. Um, and as the long, the, the more, not a divinity, you are a pillar God. As like you are in this form, you can transform back into Atlas. I would like, like to do that. It will. Um, so you begin to shrink slowly and methodically and these brimstone, this brimstone armor disappears and the very form of Atlas stands before Henry and he looks shocked, mouth agape. Atlas, I, what, what happened I just get a hug to him. you? And at first it's strange and he's kind of resistant and then he accepts it. Like he just accepts that you're Atlas, even if it's a trick, and he hugs you back. And I'll, I'll kind of push him back with my hands on his shoulders to, to look at his face. And I'll look up and down, and I'm imagining he's in his, his, his war garments, battle war armaments. Yeah. I say, Father, there's, there's no need for for you to go in there anymore. We've 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 done it. We've ended all of the, the the battle that would be all of the death that would happen because of these these doors that have been opened but I I've, I'm gonna be gone father there's all of the, the the time that I spent searching for adventure all of the the time that I wanted to to do something more with my life to feel like there was more out there well uh, I found it it found me What do I tell your mom? Tell her I love her. And he kind of nods and you kind of see him like um, back, like fighting back like tears, like wells of water in his eyes. I thank you so much for picking me up off the, the road that day. And raising me to be the man that I, I am and I have become. The world is a much better place because of people like you. And he just like begins to silently cry. Could you do me one more favor? Uh, of course. Name it. It's really two part. One, uh, could you look after Kristoff for me? I don't... He He's not taken well to this. And I'll, I'll you know, have myself look up and down, kind of changing in, into the form of Belmare and back to Atlas. He's not taking this very well. 
but he's changed so much, Father. The man he was when I first met him to the man that he is today, he has no idea uh, the potential good and the things he he's going to change for the better. He's just wrapped in sadness right now. And it, if you could also, and I wonder, and this is out of character, I wonder, do I know the status of Rowan currently? You do not. Then I'll say, uh, and if you could uh, uh, tell Rowan the same thing. <laughs> of, of course. Well, uh, my brothers and sisters are calling me back. I, I don't know myself entirely what's going on, but it's time for me to go. And he like lunges forward and gives you like another big squeeze. Of course, I hug him back. And you depart. You slice open another tear in reality and you step through it. This time, you're back on that black void of a floor with stars beneath you and above you. And there's five seats and there's four. The other four are empty and you sit uh, atop your throne, your pillar, and you say what? When? Did you get the story you were looking for? And then we find ourselves in the throne room with Kristoff and Ezreal. Their heads spinning almost from the mere events that have just unfolded and the transportation. And standing before them is a very tired Fendel and palace brother <clears throat> what happened i um i walk up to them and i and i take my my new uh magical spear and i break off um frost shard and i keep the staff i, I, I separate the two and i um I hand the staff to Pallas, and I hand the uh, shard to Findel, and I just say, uh, it's done. And so Findel takes this and says, my boy, did you take Frost's wand? That's not very nice. You know he needs it. He's not very talented without it. He doesn't need it anymore, Findle. And I pat and I hand him the Andron of uh, the medallion of Andron. But why? What? What are you? What are you saying, Kristoff? He didn't make it, Findle. And you kind of see him like grip the artifact, like the wand in his hand. <sighs> Idiot. It should have been me. I. Mm. The door's closed. Closed and destroyed. And you kind of see like um, Fendel, this older, this older, almost like frail Fendel at this point. He's just exhausted. I guess that leaves one more thing, then. And you hear Pallas pipe up and say, He's right, brother. We need to fix what our family started. Um, Of course, tell me what I need to do. We need to fix the tear. The tear and the torrent, it's, it's what's caused all of this. It's what's allowed these doors to open and become as powerful as they have become so far. How do we even begin to do that? Well, and he kind of looks at the staff. This is a good start. 
We're going to need to go inside the torrent. Quick mid-roll. We are in the last few episodes of Campaign 1, The Door to Goron. And there's something that we just wanted to say. A, thank you for listening. B, if you haven't joined our Discord, you absolutely should. It's such a beautiful community. Everybody's talking about the show, getting together for games. Like, we motivate each other. And so, realistically, if you haven't joined our Discord, you should. You could, If you haven't joined, you can go to discord.lawfulstupid.org. Join in. Have fun. Talk to us. Interact with us. Please, we crave it. We need it. And, speaking of Discord... For the finale episode, we're going to be live streaming it in our Discord. We're going to do something called a listener party. We've done a few of these, but we're going to do one for the finale. It's going to be wonderful. All of us are going to listen to, for the very first time, the finale. You should be here for that. It's August 26th, 9 p.m., and it really is something you want to be a part of. Also, one more thing. To celebrate the ending of C1, we're doing a huge, 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 huge 20% off in our merch store. So if you don't have a t-shirt, if you don't have a a wall print or a poster, and you've been wanting to get one, well, now's the time. And you can go to our store, you can go to our website, or you can go to store.lawfulstupid.org and get in on the fun. And we really, 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 really wanted to say thank you, and we hope to see you in our Discord. We're going to need to go inside the torrent. Again. (laughs) And you hear Fendel say, Unfortunately, I, I think he's right. You can't stop that from the outside. But... I think it's going to be fun. Sure thing, send me in. And you hear Pallas say, You're you're not doing this alone, brother. This is one thing I I won't let you go into it alone once more. I've, I've been there before, Pallas. It will literally tear you apart. And he kind of looks at the staff and he says, I think it will tear someone apart. Who am I to deny you your uh, your chance? By all means. And uh, Fendel says, Where, where is the... Kristoff, where's Atlas? Um, gods only know. No, Kristoff. Frost died. Right? Mm -hmm. Don't tell me Atlas died too. Um, not quite, but he he ascended. He was um, Bellamir the whole time. Who? Apparently the fifth pillar god of war and love. <laughs> you know, I, I... I haven't heard of him. <laughs> well, importantly, kind of an important fella. Um, Atlas is a drop now in an ocean of divinity we shall not see him nor his like again and palace begins to uh lead you guys out of the throne room and kind of like down some staircases as you talk and uh you hear Fendel say you know i uh, would have never seen atlas as a god that's uh I don't know what to make of that. It makes sense to me. He was better than any man I ever knew. <laughs> uh, I think I'm gonna miss his teeth. 
well, the other you at the very least. And I you think guys... I'm going to miss... Um, go, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think I'm going to miss every goddamn thing about him. Me too, Kristoff. Me too. And you guys send further, and you you travel what feels like six flights of stairs. And this is not something you recognize, Kristoff. Like it's like a, a tower under the castle that you've never visited. Um, and palace like opens this door using the staff like you can very much see like the staff was somehow connected to it and the doors kind of like swing open and you step forward into another throne room one long forgotten like covered in dust and um where the throne was there's like a broken thrown it's like shattered down the middle it's still in place but it's like cracked and you can see this feedback loop it's almost like twists and turns and these metabolic style tendrils wrapping in on themselves and spinning and then it's like piping out random bolts of arcane energy across the room and like hitting the walls and you can as you look around the walls you see these like burn marks these scorch marks and cracks everywhere and palace says this is it long this it has been long the shindo line to quell this to keep it at bay and i don't think it's possible anymore I think it's time to close it. I'm with you. When we go in there, Fendor, what... What do we do? And Fendor kind of looks between Palace and Kristoff and says, Kristoff, I think you'll know. But I don't think you can go in there like that. And he like steps forward to you and he hands you Frost's Winter's Bite back, Mm -hmm. his artifact. And he looks at the medallion, the Heart of Andrin, and says, You're... You're going to need all the help you can get. And this has been a long time coming, I think. And um, so he kind of like puts the medallion in his pocket and you see him bring up his right hand and he begins to unbuckle the Maw of Andron. And you watch as he like slides it off of his hand and he hands it over to you. It's, um, it's not going to, it's not going to, you know, and I just kind of point to my head. <laughs> and he, you see him like, <coughs> no, no, it, just don't wear it for a decade. I think you'll be fine. <laughs> and, uh, and he like puts the heart of Andrin over his, like, like his neck. And he says, um, when you, when you come back, I'll return your half. Sounds like a deal. And I put on the Maw of Andrin. When you put on the Maw of Andrin, uh, so you, you slide your right hand in it and, um, it's kind of big for you. Um, it's it's something you've never really like taken notice of that Findle, despite being this old man and kind of frail, like he was just slightly larger than you. Yeah. Um, and you watch as the Maw of Andrin begins to slowly form to you as, after you like buckle it, and it fits you perfectly, and you feel this surge of power, like 
this untold, untapped, pure connection to the torrent. Even despite the, the absence of magic here in front of this tear, and it feels real good. Very well. And Pal- Palace looks at you and says, huh, and looks at his staff and looks at you, both of your artifacts and says, if this doesn't do the trick, brother, I, I'm not sure I know what will. I have an idea. It involves a metric fuck ton of copper wire. <laughs> okay. Follow me then. After you. And he steps forward into the tear with the staff. And I reach the maw of Andrew out in front of me and step forward. Um, Christoph, you feel yourself sucked into the tear. Ezreal, you stand next to Fendel as you watch Palace and Kristoff disappear. Um, what is your immediate reaction? Do we think they can do this? <clears throat> I'm sure I'm sure they can. <clears throat> is is there anything we can do from out here or do we help them from the inside? And he, you kind of watch him like stagger back like he almost like loses his balance and he like sits against the wall. <sighs> I think we just I think we just wait. <clears throat> do you, are you all right? Do you need do you Fendel? Yeah, what dear? <laughs> what what is it? If you need some help, I'm a healer. I can help you. <laughs> I don't think... Uh, <gasps> I don't think you have the juice for this one, dear. And you watch as he uh, seemingly drips, drifts off. Drifts off like... He closes his Sleep. eyes and his head like turns. I mean, you can get closer and invest. Yeah, I'm gonna get closer. Like, I'm gonna like start prepping some kind of like. Yeah, roll a medicine check. <laughs> yeah, you can't fucking really though. Uh, yeah, so you 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 kind of hurriedly move to a side and, and kneel next to him. And panic, 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 panic. <laughs> you do what? What are you? Are you checking for pulse? Like. Yeah, Describe like, to me, like, what you're doing, like, your physical reaction to this. Like, like quickly rising horror. Uh, <laughs> that's um, emotional. I... That's emotional. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, like, checking him, you know, trying to shake him, like, Findle, stay with me. F- d- 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 and just, like, starting to, like, go through all the different healing spells in my head. What can I use to help him? And, and so you, uh, you shake him, like, and his body just, like, slumps forward. On to you. Uh. And as you like feel like you put your hand up to his neck and kind of look for a pulse and you don't you don't feel feel one. And so then you put you like you get closer to him, you kind of pull him in and he's not breathing. Uh. Well, that's never a good feeling. So I'm just going to gently lay him back down. His eyes are closed already and everything, and he's just peaceful. For the first time for you, Findel has been, Findel is now silent and still and peaceful looking. I'll probably take off like the outer cloak, whatever outer cape or cloak I may have. Mm-hmm. And like, kind of, you know, bundle it up and lay him on it. You know, almost you know, like a headrest kind of. You know, just mm-hmm. lay him out as peacefully and respectfully as possible. And I don't think there's much else I can do. 
And as you, so as you attempt to make him more comfortable, you notice um, just in the last few moments, the color in his hair fade to this gray, this white, and his his already wrinkled skin, his his experienced skin, the face with so much pain on it, it, it almost gets more frail in just a moment's time. And as you as you kneel over the body of Findle, we go to Kristoff and Pallas. And they're in this whirlwind of arcane energy. And it's it's filling their ears and sparking. And Pallas says, Brother, what do we do next? Brother, get come to me. Come here. And um, you, you, it's like walking through a sandstorm of Mm -hmm. glass and fire and electricity, and it is painful. It's not nearly as bad as the last time you went through, by all accounts. You are loaded and more powerful, but it is painful. You can hear Pallas like grunting and screaming, this is the worst pain he has ever felt. And you feel him like touch onto your, uh, your off hand, your left hand. Hold on, hold on to my collar and stay behind me. And oh, so he, he does that. He kind of moves up from your left hand and grabs your collar. Whatever you do, don't let go. And I'll hold the maw of Andrew out in front of both of us. And I'll just try to walk against the storm. And so as you do that, you kind of notice that the maw of Andrew, almost like, like a flashlight, kind of like makes this tunnel for you to walk through. Um... It's, it's still painful, but the roar of the wind and the cutting of the glass against your skin is, is subdued, suppressed. It's, it's there, but it's muted. And you're able to walk forward and, and relatively see ahead of you. Um, and, and it's not long from a walk, not long of a walk, but an arduous walk all the same. You see this dagger shoved into the ground, the ground of the Arcane Torrent, right? And as you kind of like get closer, you can see that there's this seal, or not seal, um, there is this symbol on it, this sigil even, and you know it to be that of the Shindo clan. And you can feel this power, this dark, torrential energy just pouring off of it and when you like look with your eyes like really look it's just black and it's smoking and it's pouring and you can tell this is this is the cause of the feedback loops this is the cause of all the mana voids and arcane mute spots and all the pain from this a dagger cursed and placed by your ancestor I, uh, I reach out to uh, Pallas with my left hand, the hand that has uh, Altri and Shindo, our father's sigil ring on it, and I take his hand and I go, together? Of course! And he, like, raises up his left hand and, like, grabs yours. And then we reach forward together and we grab the dagger. And you do that, and it is so painful. Our vision is filled with white snow and disrupted by the visage of Abon, the fire Janassi, sitting atop a griffin made of black ink. Its form shimmered and the ink swirled in place, its magic rotating and swirling as the ink moved around the lines of the creature, as if a river following its paths. Across from our fiery friend stands a slender, bipedal figure wreathed in shadows and feathers made of the night sky. The figure raises its right hand and extends a raven-like claw, beckoning Avon over. She dismounts, hesitation written all over her face. She knows that she was summoned here, and it couldn't have been for a good reason. 
The hairs at the nape of her neck stand tall as her boots crunch against the nearly undisturbed snow. She stares into the face of the figure across from her, its eyes dark blue, wells of energy. Avon had heard of this shadow of Goron and all the stories that had went along with it. This, seeing it in person, was somehow disturbing. She told herself silently that in just a few moments, this would all be over. Avon called out, her southern drawl shaking in the wind, shaking in her own confidence as she spoke. The figure nodded, its raven head even more ominous as it did so. The shadowy smoke, like feathers, shook in an unnaturally slow motion as it did so. Well? She prodded, forcing herself to be the dominant one in this conversation. Out with it then, what did you call me here for? The shadowy figure put its claw into its robe and pulled free a letter. The letter was freshly written and on it an ancient wax seal was embossed. I have a letter for you to deliver, the figure said, its voice reverberating in Avon's ears. A letter? What do I look like? She was cut off by the shadow raising its hand, its palm facing her as if silencing a small child. You're the only one I can trust. One of the few remaining Chiron. You shall deliver this letter, and you shall deliver it without its future bearer noticing. The raven-headed figure's voice continued to bounce back and forth in her mind as it spoke. Oh, shall I? She asked, getting heated. She didn't appreciate being told what to do. In truth, she never had. Not as a child, and not now. And what makes you think that I'm gonna do that? The shadowy figure turned its head sideways and mechanically cocked its head, as birds do. This made Avon even more disturbed. Birds were already creepy. A shadowy, bipedal, talking bird man wasn't helping that feeling at all. The figure extended its claws with the letter in hand, clearly showing the crest emblazoned in the wax seal. Is that real? She asked in amazement and awe. There's no way that could be official. I assure you, it is. You understand why I ask for you now? Kyron. Avon frowned. She did understand. She understood all too well. She furrowed her brow, took the letter from the figure. Avia the Blue. She read the words aloud. Interesting indeed. She said more to herself than to the raven. The raven continued to stare at her through one eye its head cocked sideways, still. Well, that's enough for me then, if there's nothing else. She said as she put the letter in her satchel and mounted her griffin. She tried not to look at the head of her mount for fear of shuddering right off the saddle. The figure shook its bird head and Avon spurred the mount into action. She took flight and tried her best not to look back at the shadowy figure in the distance. As Avon's form vanished into the distance, the shadowy figure stood still in the vast snowy fields of silence. The figure waved a hand, and the shadows began to fall free of it. It turned and began its long trek back to the barrier containing the capital of silence. The shadowy feathers leaving a trail as the figure walked, snow crunching beneath its feet. As the last of the skies fell away, we can clearly see Findle, 
Findle brushes off a few lingering feathers and lets loose a deep sigh. <sighs> you feel this darkness begin to climb through both of your hands. And you watch Pallas instinctively point that staff at your hands, and he's not a magician or a wizard or any type of actual caster, but you're watching as like magic is like attacking your hands, the darkness on your hands, and he's just trying to push it back. I take my mod hand and I put it over both of our hands, um, kind of like two hand gripping it now. Mm hmm. And the two of you kind of pour your very will into this, your very souls into this. And you watch as the darkness gets pushed back into the blade and it starts to get almost like vacuumed slowly, methodically back into the blade. And you just, you're starting to feel this softness. It's almost like it was too easy. The, like the world is just, the torrent was built for you. And you watch as the dagger crushes in on itself. And everything feels right. And there's a loud pop. And Ezreal, as you stand over, or as you kneel over Fendel, there for you it is a roaring noise that fills the chamber. <laughs> and the feedback loop is gone. And it's quiet? It's quiet. You can hear your own heartbeat. Did they leave behind all. any sort of, like, rift? Like, arcane rift or anything that they walked through, or...? No. I think I just sit there. It's been a day. Just taking in the silence. And on your knees, next to the body of Fendel, your beating heart, the only sound in the chamber. This is gonna be some great news when Christoph gets back. Uh... <laughs> Everything I love is dead. Well, 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 uh, Dwayne, thank you, first and foremost, second and second most, um, we get a little confirmation on, on uh, the next episode. Is that, um, that thing? Is that is that the is this is this the second to last episode of Lawful Stupid? Devin, I think you need to roll for <laughs> Oh, he gives nothing change. away to the last moment. He gives nothing. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to the episode. Uh, this week's roll, this month's roll rally. <laughs> it's me, the God Man. Yeah. Is, uh, Everything's great for me. Is brought to you by adoption exchange we're rolling for humanity for them cause is they hook children up who are in the foster care system with parents who are um, in the process of, of really just want to take these kids in so they don't have to sit in the foster care system as long as they do until they find a permanent home for these kids so it's a really awesome cause you roll that d20 for us and we are going to get a 16 that is $16 Ooh. it goes towards adoption exchange mm -hmm. where are those rolls when I need them in game you know what mm -hmm. I'll give them over adoption exchange it's fine with me it's fine. Yep. You're, Bellamare is you, you, you're real good. Game. He's got mad ability scores. Don't worry about it. 
I'll cover up this shit roll. <laughs> roll a two. That is a 43. What? That's <laughs> a 30. I rolled a d20. I don't get it. Two, but there it is. Two, two, two on die, 42. That's my dirty score. That was my weak stat. That was intelligent. That, that, that's an intelligence saving throw. <laughs> hey, seriously, Dwight? I I really appreciate everybody listening and going on this journey with us. And But I think there's nothing more appropriate than to say bye oh, bye we love you bye, bye. Makes me happy. Avia fills our view, standing at the edge of a cliff to the north of Uri. The crown jewel of Orenthal painted in ambers and pinks as the sun began its slow descent into dusk. She looks out over Uri, a somber smile across her face as she pulls free a letter from her robes. She idly turned the letter over in her hands, examining it. We can see the letter is worn from travel, and as she runs her finger over the wax seal, we can plainly see the small flame and crystal symbol. An old arcana symbol, Avia says aloud to the empty air. She frowned, the corners of her mouth turned downward and her brow furrowing. But why? Her fingertips begin to glow and the wax seal slides free, but stays intact. She opened the letter gingerly and unfolded it. My dearest Avia, by the time you read this, you'll have passed on to the next world. I don't want you to be sad or worried. I knew it was coming, and I've made peace with it. I knew our past has been mired in frustration and resentment. I sympathize with how you feel, and I would have made the same decision still. We have come so far since I gifted you with a mantle, and I am honored to have known you. Avia, you are by far one of the most talented mages I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. I hope you find what you are looking for at the side of Kristoff and his servants. If you don't, Avia, I hope you continue forward on your own path. Don't let the weight of the mantle keep you from moving onward. One more thing. Kristoff is going to be lost for a while. Everyone will assume he is dead. Nindavia, I assure you he is not. He is lost to the torrent. You can find him, but it won't be easy. I've written some instructions for a spell I think may help you find him. Avia, proceed with caution. The spell I give you isn't for the faint of heart. I know you can do it. You are, after all, Avia the Blue. I just implore you to go into ignoring the gravity of the spell. Forever gratefully yours, Fender Summerhall. Tears drop slowly beginning to stain the page, the ink of words blurring slightly, and Avia folds and puts the letter away. What have you gotten yourselves into? Avia asked aloud, as if expecting Kristoff or Findle to respond. Her only reply was the same reply she had been getting from the coin. Silence.